Terry Bam Bam Gordy, one of the best big men in the history of professional wrestling, not just in the continental United States, but over in the land of the rising sun, teaming up with Dr. Death Steve Williams, facing off against Masawa, the Freebirds Von Erichs rivalry, the fact that he started as a teenager, he was a true prodigy, he was truly one of the best on the mic, in the ring, he was truly a wild child, he did a whole lot of stuff, he lived a bunch of lifetimes in his 40 years on this earth and he loved his kids and you have to wonder what would the career and more importantly the life of Terry Gordy how would it have gone had he not suffered the seizure on that flight to Japan in 1993 how much further would his career have gone we'll never know it truly is one of the biggest what ifs in the history of professional wrestling I'm John Renton with my review Dark Side of the Ring Terry Gordy Final Flight of the Freebird yeah this, this one was tough. I mean, there's a little bit of new information in this. For those that aren't that familiar with Terry Bam Bam Gordy's career, it this was a nice episode, but it really, really was tragic because you want to talk about Dark Side of the Ring. And I'm not saying that Terry Gordy didn't have his demons. I mean, wrestling historians talk about that. His colleagues, they know that he sure loved to drink. And boy, he could turn really, really violent when he drank because he was just a big old country boy that really could hit goddamn hard. And you see this footage, you know. <clears throat> Terry Gordy, truly born to wrestle. I I think it was Jimmy Garvin that said that as far as the um, the world-class documentary that uh, WWE ended up doing. And just a lot of people just, you know, speak so highly of him and some great talking heads here. And next week, I just want to talk about <clears throat> that right here. Next week is Brutus the Barber Beefcake. That one's going to be interesting. So, anyway, the talking heads, uh, no, not same as it ever was, same as it ever was, not as the days go by. Kevin Von Erich, that makes sense, not only because he's the last surviving Von Erich of the original ones, but also the fact that, well, he can talk about Terry Gordy because he faced off against him, and just obviously they had a camaraderie and a respect for each other. Uh, Mick Foley, Mick Foley was great in this. Mick Foley really, honestly, is always great in these... <laughs> He can find something nice to say about anybody, even somebody like Matt Bourne. Yeah, that, that that whole goddamn fiasco with Matt Bourne. But Mick Foley had a lot of good things to say about Terry Gordy. Jim Cornette, you could tell it tore him up how Terry Gordy's career went. David Manning, referee, booker for World Class Championship Wrestling. Uh, Jimmy Garvin and his kids. Ray Gordy, who I forgot that... You know, Terry Gordy's son actually wrestled in WWE. Yeah, Slam Master J, and, you know, he was part of, um, you know, part of the team with Festus and everything. It's just, it's kind of, kind of, I, I totally forgot. I, I don't think he still wrestles anymore, but I totally forgot about that. Gotta say, though, that team with Festus, at least it was over for a bit. It was weird, certainly weird. <laughs> um, Miranda Gordy, who is his daughter, is wrestling and apparently doing well for herself, and that's good for her. Um, the world-class championship wrestling footage was just so great. The shrill, shrieking fans, the packed arenas, the Sportatorium, Reunion Arena, Texas Stadium, the fact that so many venues, just, you know, so many people flock to these venues to see the Freebirds von Eric rivalry. Um, the J the Japanese footage, I, I really need to seek some of that shit out. I need to look up some of that on YouTube. And I think it's for mostly All Japan, so I might have to subscribe to All Japan streaming service just to see some of this stuff. But <coughs> the stint in WCW, in between his Japanese tours, when he was teaming up with Dr. Death is the Miracle Violence Connection. You want to talk about a great goddamn name, but I'm getting ahead of myself here. The bottom line is, is Terry Gordy especially before the accident. I mean, and to think, he was born in 61. He died in 2001. To think, to think just how good, just how good he was before that seizure, before his body finally said, okay, you don't want to fucking listen to me, that's it. But Terry wrestling at the age of 14. Um, he was Terry Meeker. Me, 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 me. I don't know why I said it like that. I believe in Mississippi, the Gulf Coast region, um... Pensacola, I, I know there's a lot of territories down there that he was wrestling. I believe he wrestled in Alabama. Uh, Goulas, you know, used him and Hayes. The Freebirds being on them. Marijuana pills. 
Yeah, the, that line is from the Jim Cornette podcast because you want to talk about wrestling historian. There you go. And Jim Cornette was great here talking about how Terry grew up and all the other stuff. How he studied on the road and he learned to be a man. Yeah, he may have learned some bad habits, but just looking at how he was in the ring. Nick Bockwinkle told the story on the Legends of Roundtable, or Legends of Wrestling Roundtable <clears throat> discussion. I don't remember if it was the 1970s. I don't remember exactly what it was, but <clears throat> Bockwinkle had made an appearance in whatever territories, Mississippi or something, or Alabama, that <clears throat> Gordy and Hayes were working in. And that they were as smooth as him and Ray, and they were just great. And Hayes, you know, praise that Hayes. Unfortunately, the only one of the Freebirds, the original incarnation, by the way, is still here. Yeah, Jimmy Garvin is. I don't really count Jimmy Garvin as a member of the Freebirds. He was a member of the <coughs> the fabulous, or not so fabulous, Freebirds. Even though Garvin was good in his own right. Do not get me wrong. But... <coughs> Met Michael Hayes, Mississippi, or thereabouts. <laughs> Hayes could talk. Hayes couldn't really wrestle, but Hayes could talk. He could get by in the ring. Um, <clears throat> Jimmy Garvin met him early, too. I mean, you got to think about Jimmy Garvin, how he broke into wrestling. Teaming up with Terry Garvin. You want to talk about that piece of goddamn shit? And also Ronnie Garvin. Ron Garvin. Rugged Ron Garvin. <laughs> and jimmy garvin was the youngest he worked as a manager and then would get in the ring and do some stuff or even wrestled the wrestling bear at one point that was kind of funny <clears throat> that's another legends around legends of wrestling round table and gordy was a muscle hayes was a talker the freebirds were born they used freebird by Lawrence skinner in the mid-south coliseum which was cool that <clears throat> i wish they'd had footage of that unfortunately they didn't um they caught the attention of Bill Watts in Mid-South Wrestling. This is when Leroy McGurk, his territory basically was evaporating. And, you know, Watts was cultivating his own <clears throat> brand here and his own hard-hitting style. But he also recognized he needed some pizzazz. Um, Buddy Roberts had to be put with them because Roberts could be the bump guy. Uh, Gordy could be the muscle and the heavy hitter and that kind of stuff as opposed to the muscle and the light hitter. That would not make sense. And Hayes could be the talker and stay out of the ring as much as possible, except for the junkyard dog angle. <clears throat> but uh, I wish they'd spent a little bit more time on the Mid-South stuff, but it is what it is. We're trying to tell the story of Terry Gordy, not just of the Freebirds. Two world class. <clears throat> they were friends initially with the Freebird, or with uh, the Freebirds were initially friends with themselves. The Freebirds are initially friends with the Von Ericks, and <clears throat> then we get the feud going. I wish they had shown the footage of when Carey took on Flair. <clears throat> Hayes was a referee. I want to say David Manning was the other referee. I, if it wasn't Manning, it was. <clears throat> it had to have been Manning because Manning was like the only young referee they had. I think Bronco Lubick or Lubick or however you say that name was was one of the referees and a couple others, <clears throat> but. I wish they'd shown that because Terry was the one that like slammed the cage door on Carrie's head, and that showed great strength because uh, Terry was probably like, "Hi." I don't know. I don't think Terry talked like that. Um, Carrie might have because Carrie really couldn't cut a promo. He definitely can't now. That's mean. Let's get back to the goddamn review. <laughs> but a marriage made in heaven is how Kevin Von Erich described it, and. Uh, you know, this isn't a war between Georgia and Texas. This is a war between decency and filth. Or Texas and Georgia, decency and filth. I flipped that around. I flipped it and reversed it like I'm Missy Elliott. Uh, thankfully not. Because Missy Elliott has talent. I'm just a weirdo talking about wrestling and movies. Thank you guys very much for watching, by the way. So, the you know, the fans went crazy for him. The girls were shrill shrinking. Shrinking? They were shrieking and shrinking. Possibly wanting to shrink into the background and everything and say, Oh, I didn't want them to see me. I don't know what's going on with me. They were shrieking. The boyfriends of these respective women <laughs> were cheering the free bird because they were probably pissed off that their girlfriends loved the Von Erichs so much. And it was a two-year run, kind of, but not really. I mean, yes, the Freebirds came in sometime in 82, <laughs> kicked off the whole thing with the Christmas night aforementioned Flair, Carrie, cage match. And then they had that run until Texas Stadium in May of 84, and then they went and did the brief stint in WWF, which didn't work. 
at all. They, it was very, very, very uh, brief. <laughs> I think it was maybe, what, a, a, a month? Three weeks, a month? Um, there was one funny story where Terry basically headbutted a, uh, a police car because he was handcuffed. Can't imagine that would have uh, led to any brain issues, um, but Terry was a wild man. Not Mark Marrow, because Terry could cut a promo. Poor, poor man. Marrow's actually a really good motivational speaker, just not a great promo in wrestling. So, uh, booze and the, the booze was one thing, the marijuana was one thing, but then the pain pills and the other stuff. He fit right in Japan. It was like a custom made glove, um, hard inning style, the, you know, the matches that he had. He had two, he had both his ACLs torn and could have gotten, you know, could have gotten surgery, but he would need to drop the weight and everything. So apparently, and as according to Miranda, he called Richard Simmons, or he just did the videos of Richard Simmons, or <coughs> Richard Simmons came to his house. I don't actually know. Picturing Terry Gordy dancing to Richard Simmons and doing the sweating of the oldies and that kind of stuff. Is Richard Simmons still alive? Because I'm genuinely curious. I thought he might have passed away a few years ago. But he went from like 320, 300, 320 to down to about 265. So he was leaner. It took the pressure off his knees. Even though he still had two fucking torn ACLs, he didn't have to carry so much weight on it. Because apparently you don't need your ACLs when you're Terry Bam Bam Gordy. <clears throat> the match with Masawa, which is something I, I've seen it once. I need to seek it out again. June of 1991, his style still holds up. Uh, he was a Triple Crown champion in all Japan. That's a big goddamn deal. That's a big accolade for an American. Mir Miracle Violence connection with uh, Dr. Death, the uh, WCW footage, you know, in 1992. It was, was it? it was Great American Bash 92, where they had the tag tournament. <laughs> and then I believe they had a match at uh, Beach Blast 92. And just the fact that him and Dr. Death just as a great team. And I did um I, I did like how they got they got some family videos and footage and stuff like that. Uh Richard Aslinger. Aslinger, yes, I think that's how you said he's his nephew. He had some heartbreaking stuff to tell a little bit later. <clears throat> Terry was very depressed because he was always on the road. He was earning money, he was doing what he loved, but he also loved his family. And that was the thing where really wrestling just took hold. Wrestling wasn't just his mistress, wrestling was his life, and wrestling did not let go. Then the Dr. Death um, stuff where I th it had to have been from the early 2000s, <clears throat> thereabouts. But he was talking about how there was an overdose and he slapped Terry awake, trying to get him back up. And... Then the 1993 flight to Japan where the seizure, <clears throat> Dr. Death couldn't get him awake. His nephew ended up being there. Family, you know, was trying to, family was trying to be there for him. And Terry <clears throat> inside may have been the same person. Just couldn't project it. You see, is, look, at, look at how his eyes were, even in 92. And then you take a look at how they were <clears throat> at, right after that. Once he got back in the ring, somewhere around 94, 95, done. Totally changed. That's the thing. Brain damage, whatever, lack of oxygen, whatever it was, Terry Gordy was never the same after that. He got back in the ring. <laughs> His nephew helped him. The Smoky Mountain Wrestling Run, and this is where Cornette really got emotional because he said he could do the moves, but there was no pop to it. There was no energy. The energy was gone. Muscle memory alone he was able to carry. Um... <clears throat> He's able to carry it off, but it's just like, and that's the thing. That's just how good he was. So it even half, like what he used to be mentally, and I'm not, I'm not talking about intelligence. I'm just talking about in the ring. He can still do that stuff. IWA King of the Death Match uh, <clears throat> tournament, I believe at Kawasaki Stadium. He took on Mick Foley. <clears throat> um, it was hard hitting. Foley told him to lay the punches in. And he, the bottom line is Terry should have not kept wrestling. He just shouldn't have. Yes, he was born to do it. it. He wasn't just born with it. It wasn't just Maybelline. He was born to do it, but he just couldn't do it anymore. <clears throat> the ECW run, Michael Hayes got him the job as the executioner in the WWF. Then you have the RF um, interview footage where those guys were just hounding him, those pieces of shit. Um... <clears throat> 
when Hayes got him the job in 96, they were hoping, putting the executioner mask on him, hopefully the Terry could, you know, if he could get back to being Terry, they would take the mask off and he would be back that. But that way they wouldn't diminish his meaning because the fans would know who the fuck he was. And it was very sad to watch. The match would take, or I believe it, the December in your house in 96, I... I don't remember the name of it. I'm sorry. I don't remember. It wasn't Buried Alive. That was October. And the pill addiction kept up. He got more and more wild. The stint in WWF did not hold. <clears throat> Back to the indies. Fans, um, you know, fully told a story about how fans were not really getting in the ring to take Polar, or, you know, to, so the daughter could take a Polaroid with Terry and them. And it, it fully wanted to yell at him, like, you know, that's a chance to meet a wrestling legend right there. And. <clears throat> Foley, don't get me wrong, Foley really did mean a lot when it came to wrestling. It still does. But Foley also respects the people that came before him. I wish they had shown some GWF uh, footage, Global Wrestling Force, or Global, no, yeah, Global Wrestling Federation, I mean. I wish they had shown that. Because him and Foley had a pretty good match, as I recall, in 91, 92, somewhere around that. But... <clears throat> Um, he spent more time with his kids, uh, Terry did, more RF footage, he was sorry to his fans for the seizure and the fact that he wasn't the man that he once was, this is where it really got Son, Ray was gonna team with him in an indie show, and he couldn't go, and after that show, the next day, can, uh, Jack, uh, cognitive heart failure, or can, uh, he had heart failure because of a blood clot. Not an OD, not none of that. He died because of a blood clot and <clears throat> heart failure. His body finally just had enough. He met a ton to a lot of people, and Terry Bam Bam Gordy truly... I mean, obviously he wouldn't still be wrestling. Even if that seizure hadn't happened. Even if he was still who he was, <clears throat> had gotten addictions totally... You know, his addictions totally nullified. And had been able to continue wrestling. He probably wouldn't have wrestled much past, say, 2005... But he still would have meant something to the business, even today, for advice and everything. And it's just really, really sad that Terry Bam Bam Gordy was not able to see how much he meant to so many people. They show footage of his daughter wrestling at indie shows. I wish her nothing but the best. Uh, she hits about as hard as him, from what I can tell. So hopefully she gets a chance to be on a bigger stage. That being said, Terry Bam Bam Gordy, rest in peace. You hell of a goddamn big man. One of the best big men ever in professional wrestling. And truly one of the biggest what-ifs when it comes to professional wrestling. So next week, Bruce the Barber Beefcake. There we go. What are some of your favorite Terry Bam Bam Gordy memories? Let me know in the comments. Like, share, subscribe. Twitter handle in the description. I'm John Rentland. I'll see you soon.